Welcome everyone, Kwasini here with a discussion about diplomacy in Total War, Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires and how you can use it to vastly improve your campaigns than before. One of the examples of diplomacy is actually not using it. Calls. Let me explain. When you start a campaign, generally so. there will be a bunch of deals to make, non-aggression packs, trade agreements, etc. But here's the thing. While you might be tempted to make those pacts, I mean, a non-aggression pact isn't a defensive alliance, sometimes it isn't a good idea to do it. Now, I'm using Katrin's campaign, Tsarina Katrin's campaign over here uh, as an example, but the lessons I'm going to give can be applied to any campaign in the entire game. Now, with Katrin, in her campaign, she can make a trade agreement with Krakadrak from turn one. That's exactly what I've done, and since then I've gotten military access as well as an aggression pact. But one of the things she can do fairly early on in her campaign as well is make a non-aggression pact with Ostermark. But this is a bad idea, as it would be in other similar situations. The reason why is that the Ostermark will have two fairly early game enemies, and those are going to be Azag and Draika. For whatever reason, the AI for both Azag and Draika, at least on Legendary, I've played on no other difficulty, but on Legendary at the very least, Azag and Draika are pretty hard coded to go after the Ostermark. Now, if you make a non aggression pact, a trade agreement, uh, military access, as I can do all of these things here. While you, this would give me almost 1600, maybe more, maybe less, it would also serve to piss off both Draika and Azak. And when you're playing as Katrin, you don't have the luxury of getting into a war with both Draika and Azak, or either of them really. Because you've got issues to the north. You've got Frat, I've taken help it in this campaign already. You've got Trog. You've got uh, Prague as well to deal with one or another. Either conquering them or confederating them. So you don't have the luxury, at least in the first few turns, of getting into a war with them. And so by avoiding any deals with Ostermark, maybe even declaring a war on them short. is actually the smart move. Hell, you could go, like in this situation, since I know that, since I know that Ostermark is basically finished right now as a faction, I can just go to Azak and get a bit of money for declaring war against them. But the crucial aspect here isn't about money, it's about ensuring that the war doesn't start between myself and Azak in this situation. And due to that, by making that kind of deal with him, I ensure that Azag is not going to bother me and he's going to be on a collision course with Draika. Sometimes he wins, most of the time Draika wins this. But crucially, you're not getting involved in it, you're staying out of it, and you can take advantage of it. Facing Draika in a head-to-head -head confrontation is generally a nightmare. Her army is very powerful because she's got ways of dealing with your spells she's also got incredibly uh, strong melee units and ranged units even though her ranged units are generally weaker than other wood elven factions they're still wood elven units now the ostermark does still have an army over here but it's not going to last for much longer now a similar situation we can find actually over here if you're playing as malekith for instance the faction of grand over here you can make some pretty good deals with them very early on. But, <laughs> this is the big but. They start a war with Valkia. And if you make those deals with Grand, Valkia can turn around and slap you in the face. In fact, it's actually quite far better if you take over Grand's territory yourself. Like, deal with the Skaven here in Harkaldra, and then move on Grand itself. I know it's silly that... Uh, you want to turn against friendly factions to yourself because another threat, uh, because a, a threat that they have that will be a common threat at one point or another um, um, may uh, declare, uh, declare war on you. But it is generally better to avoid starting these kind of wars when you're simply not at all 
uh, prepared for. And Katrin, neither Katrin or Malekith or others are prepared for those kind of situations from the very start of, of their campaigns. And so you want to delay it. On top of that, the deal I've made with Azag will ensure that he's going to hesitate to a degree uh, to Get declare war against me. He likely will at one point, but I've gained some uh, bonus points to diplomacy because I've declared war on the Ostermark over there. Even though Ostermark's army, for whatever reason, has marched into uh, has marched into the mountain, so to speak. Now, to end the turn, that's one case of where not getting engaged diplomatically or getting engaged in a way that doesn't feel natural is the smarter decision because yeah Isaac has taken the capital of the Ostermark isn't a good idea to piss off a guy who has two you full stacks at, uh, so early on in the campaign nor is it a good idea by the way to make a deal with Osland over there because you might want to take over their territory you want to plan ahead when you do these kind of things like Osland yeah they can be a barrier sure but they've got free regions there or Festus um, and yes, you can make some deals with them, but it's actually smarter to avoid getting entangled with them and take over their territory, especially after Festus has weakened them. Now over here, there are some other things uh, to uh, to do. So I'm going to take out Frot's uh, last remaining settlement over here in Troll Country. That's basically removed the last of his armies. Now, Catherine, now transgressions. I have another issue. And that issue is, of course, Prague. You can declare war on Prague, but war is a Please wasteful save. thing. It's a wasteful thing in particular because Prague can be a higher level if you confederate with them. So instead of declaring war on them, the it is actually a better and smarter move to get agreements with Prague. Though, since they hate my guts, it's going to take a while to get those kind of uh, agreements uh, to for diplomacy to take Proud effect. Uh, so I, to speak. Of I can obviously speed this up, uh, this particular process up, um, by uh, by giving them gifts. Though I'm going to wait one turn for Catherine to recover a bit. Now another thing to mention is Let's hear what you um, have to say. is we'll the situation of Krakadra. See, this particular front in the north is not one I want to deal with in in my camp campaign uh, for a while. I, I might have been smart. It might have been a bit smarter to uh, to delay uh, to delay giving that territory. By the way, because of the Ottomans, but. Um, Let's I don't want to deal with this front. I don't want to head off, uh, head into the far north so early on. I've got other things Which to deal to with. I, I want to deal with the Zazel, but I also don't want to. Uh, I don't want Krakadrak to be wiped up. So what I am going to do, having taken Helpit, is I'm going to give Helpit to them. Helpit in particular is not a great territory if you're playing Catherine. If you're playing Boris Ursus, that it is good. But even as Boris Ursus, you might benefit from giving help it to the dwarves. They'll pay for it, and crucially, they will survive better in their campaign. Because Trog then has to go all the way here, and you can intercept them along the way uh, if you uh, do something. Uh, if you do something like that, if he does something like that, it's all about using diplomacy to advance your goals. My goal Mistress is to create us. as strong of an empire as possible uh, in this uh, particular campaign. So giving help to the dwarves is going to be Frozen really useful. One thing to mention, by the way, is if you're going to give a territory like this to another faction, you may want to ensure it has a barracks in it. Because the dwarves, for instance, are going to uh, utilize help it a great deal better if it has a sparring chamber and they will also put more value on the settlement if it has those kind of structures in it because dwarves gave me quite a decent amount of money for that they wouldn't have given me as much money if it had say an economic a basic economic building at level one the AI does like having those kind of recruitment options because the AI doesn't uh, destroy buildings in a campaign 
Eradication. And same idea, by the way, with Kostaltin. Like, one of the things Katrin can do so very early on in I her campaign is take out Azazel. And then, once you've taken out Azazel, do you hold on to Azazel's territory? That's not worth it. Far better to sell it to Kostaltin and get a uh, trade agreement, on aggression pack, military access, etc. If you're playing Castalton, you give it to the minor faction of Brotherhood of the Bear. Actually, if you're playing Castalton, it's worth it, diplomatically, to declare war on Azazel turn one. He'll start heading towards you. He won't want to wipe out the minor Keys of Life faction, the Brotherhood of the Bear, and you can gift them the Tower of Crack uh, early on, and they can form your northern frontier while you go deal with other issues like Frat, Trog, uh, Osland, Festus, etc. Stabilize your campaign uh, situation. So gifting, ter gifting territory in general is really useful. Uh, some settlements are so valuable that the AI will literally bend the knee to you. I'll be al allow, uh, allow, allow you to vassalize them. For instance, if you're playing as either Arkhan the Black or Cetra, hell, even Kalida, though it's harder with her. But if you're playing with either Cetra or Arkhan the Black, one of the things you can do very early on in your campaign is get the Great Desert of Araby, get the structure there, and sell that settlement to Rapunz. And what I've done without fail, playing as both Arkan and etc., is vassalize Rapunz and Rapunz, uh, because the AI will, uh, because when you're trading a settlement away, the AI will place very high value on that if it has special structures if it's valuable to you or if it's valuable uh, to them now if you're playing as the tomb kings the great desert rb isn't particularly great for you but it is it can be great for repons or any human faction because it gives them immunity to uh, desert attrition similarly you could give it to volkmar and vassalize him instead if you so desire and volkmar might end up being a more useful ally as a result of that. Those kind of diplomatic options. So plan your moves in, in advance. Like for instance, in this campaign, I've made a bunch of agree agreements with Halabayam, but that's because I know that I can deal with Festus if push comes to shove. And actually, in this particular case, it seems like Toddbringer is dealing with Festus uh, in quite of an effective fashion, though Kazrak is probably gonna have some things to say about that. Um, but yeah, giving that uh, that kind of uh, territory planning planning when it comes to that, uh, the AI will is also going to be more willing wow. to accept deals but the I weaker they are. So right now, if I toggle the fog of war, though you can tell um, faction strength by looking at the screen and looking at the relative balance of power. Attention. This will become less useful as you play further and further into a campaign. But early on, it is especially useful to determine a faction strength. Um, and whether or not they've lost their army. So right now, Prague is not going to be quite so willing to accept any deal with me because they've got their armies still intact. But when they do lose their armies, and they will lose their armies, make no mistake on that, uh, the Skaven over here of Clan Ferric are going to wipe out this army or start heading towards that settlement. But once they do lose their army, uh, they're going to be more willing to engage in a confederation. And I could get the uh, Prague at level 3, maybe even level 4, if I play my cards right, as opposed to myself declaring war on them, which I would generally do, despite the devotion cost, declaring war on them to take Prague, but then I would get to that either level 2 or even level 1, depending on when I'm doing it, as opposed to getting at that level 3 or 4. And also getting money along the way for all the diplomatic options that are going to make themselves available. Defensive Alliance, Military Alliance, Military Axis. So diplomacy can be key to helping your empire, especially early on in a campaign, when you've got a very tough situation like the one Katrin has, or Malekith, or some other factions may have early on in their campaign, when you have a lot of foes to deal with, using diplomacy to create the kind of front line, using a minor faction to help uh, to stave off your enemy's advance. Because if I give this fort to Prague, right, and I give the Tower of Crack to Castalton, and with help it on the, the dwarves, I don't really have to care as much about the northern situation, especially if Frog, uh, if Trog, sorry, decides to start, start sending his armies towards Hellpit, and I wipe them out, then I really don't have to care about it. 
I mean, eventually the dwarves might be wiped out, but it's gonna take them a fairly, it's gonna take the enemies to the north a fairly substantial amount of time. Let alone the fact, by giving up this territory, by giving the tower to Castalton, it's gonna incentivize him to uh, stay in the north, deal with the situation there in the north. So he will do a pretty decent job at stabilizing uh, the situation that does exist uh, over here in, in the north. And that's all there is to say for it. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time.